Sharp's Christmas. The two sealed. One of them, a dark-haired man with a scarred face and hard eyes, eased back the cock of his rifle, aimed the weapon, but then, after a few seconds, lowered the gun. Too far away, he said softly. The second man was even taller than the first, and like his companion, wore the faded green jacket of the 95th Rifles. But instead of a Baker rifle, he carried a curious volley gun of seven barrels, each of half-inch bore, and fired by a single flintlock. It was a murderous weapon, with a kick like an angry mule. But the man looked strong enough to use it. No good trying with this, he whispered, hefting the huge gun. Only works at close range. If we get too close, they'll run, the first man suggested. Where can they run to? the second man asked. His accent was of Ulster. It's a field, so it is. They can't run away. We'll just walk up and shoot him. Unless you want to strangle the sod, sir. Shooting's quicker. Major Richard Sharp lowered his rifle's flint. Come on, he said, and the two men stood and walked gingerly towards the three bullocks. You think they'll charge us, Pat? Sharp asked. They're gelded, sir, Sergeant Major Patrick Harper offered. Got about as much spunk as three blind mice. They look dangerous to me, Sharp said. They've got horns. But they're missing their other equipment, sir, Harper said. They can't sing the low notes if you follow me. He pointed to one of the bullocks. He's got some rare, fine fat on him, sir. He'll roast just lovely. The chosen bullock, unaware of his fate, watched the two men. I just can't shoot it, Sharp protested. You bayoneted all those goats in Portugal, sir, Harper pointed out, remembering a time when they had been stripping the countryside bare in front of a French advance. So what's different? I hate goats. But this is Christmas dinner, sir. Harper encouraged his commanding officer. Proper roast beef, sir. Plum pudding and wine. We've got the plums and we've got the wine, so all we need is the beef and the suet. Why do you get suet? Off the bullock, of course, Harper said, with all the scorn of a country-raised man talking to someone from the city. It's white and tasty, sir, and stacked around the kidneys, so it is. But you'd best shoot the poor beast first. It's kinder. Sharp walked closer to the animal. It had large brown sad eyes that watched Sharp with an expression of gentle fatalism. Sharp cocked the rifle and the bullock blinked at the strange noise. Sharp began to raise the weapon, then lowered it again. I can't do it, Pat. One shot, sir. Imagine it's a Frenchman. Sharp lifted the rifle, cocked it, and aimed straight between the bullock's eyes. The animal still gazed at him. You do it, Sharp said to Harper, lowering the gun. With this, Harper held up the volley gun. I'll blow its bloody head off. We don't want its head, do we? Sharp said. Just its rump and suet, so go on, do it. It's not very accurate, sir, not a volley gun. It's grand for killing frogs, so it is, but not for slaughtering cattle. And I like the brains, I do. My ma used to fry them in a bit of butter, and it tasted lovely. I don't want to spatter brains across half of Spain. Best use your rifle. So have the rifle, Sharp said, offering the weapon. Harper gazed at the rifle for a second, but did not take it. The thing is, sir, the huge Irishman said, that I drank a drop too much last night. My hands are shaky, see? Best that you do it, sir. Sharp hesitated. The light company had set their hearts on a proper Christmas dinner. Bloody roast beef, gravy thick enough to choke a rat, and a brandy-soaked pudding clogged with plums and suet. It's daft, isn't it? he said. I wouldn't think twice if it was a frog. It's only a bloody cow. It's a bullock, sir. Well, what's the difference? You can't milk this one, sir. Right, Sharp said, and aimed the rifle again. Just hold still, he ordered the bullock then crept a half-pace closer so that the gun's blackened muzzle was only a few inches from the coarse black hair between the beast's sad eyes. I shot a tiger once, he said. Did you now, sir, Harper said, without showing much interest. So just imagine that the beast is a tiger and shoot it. Sharp gazed into the beast's eyes. He had put wounded horses out of their misery and had shot enough hares, rabbits, and foxes in his time, 
but somehow he could not squeeze the trigger. And then he was saved from having to shoot at all because a small, high, and eager voice hailed him from the field's far side. Mr. Sharp, sir! Mr. Sharp! Sharp lowered the rifle's cock, then turned to see Ensign Charles Nichols running over the grass. Nichols had only just arrived in Spain and went everywhere at a tumultuous pace as if he feared the war might get away from him. Slow down, Mr. Nichols, Sharp said. Yes, sir, I will, sir, Ensign Nichols said, not slowing his pace at all. It's Colonel Hogan, sir, he said as he reached Sharp. He wants you, sir. He says it's the frogs, sir, and he says we've got to stop some frogs, sir, and it's urgent. Sharp slung the rifle on his shoulder. We'll do this later, Sergeant Major, he said. Yes, sir, of course we will. The bullock watched the men go, then lowered its head to the grass. Were you going to shoot it, sir? Nichols asked excitedly. What do you think I was going to do? Sharp asked the boy. Strangle it? I couldn't shoot one, sir, Nichols admitted. I feel too sorry for it. He gazed at Sharp and Harper in admiration, and no wonder, for there were no two men in Wellington's army more admired or feared. It had been Sharp and Harper who had taken the French eagle at Talavera, who had stormed through the breach of blood at Badajoz, and cut the great road at the route of Vittoria, and Nichols hardly dared believe he was in their battalion. "'You think we're going to fight, sir?' he asked eagerly. "'I hope not,' Sharp said. "'No, sir?' Nichols sounded disappointed. "'It's Christmas in three days,' Sharp said. "'Would you want to die at Christmas?' "'I don't suppose I would, sir.' Nichols admitted. The ensign was seventeen, but looked fourteen. He wore a second-hand uniform coat on which his mother had sewn loops of tarnished gold lace, then turned up the yellow-tipped sleeves so that they did not hang down over his hands. I was worried, Nichols had explained to Sharp when he arrived at the battalion just a week before, that I would miss the war. Awful bad luck to miss a war. Sounds like good luck to me. No, sir. A fellow must do his duty, Nichols had said earnestly, and the ensign did try very hard to do his duty, and was never discouraged when the veterans of the regiment laughed at his eagerness. He was, Sharp thought, like a puppy, wet nose, tail up, and raring to bear his milk teeth at the enemy. But not at Christmas, Sharp thought. And so he hoped Hogan was wrong, and that the frogs were not moving, for Christmas was no time to be killing. You probably won't have to fight. Colonel Hogan said, then sneezed violently. He pummeled his nose with a giant red handkerchief, then blew scraps of snuff from the map he had spread on the farmhouse table of his billet. It could be rumor, Richard, nothing but rumor. Did you murder your bullock now? Never got round to it, sir. And how did your men know we were going to shoot one anyway? I am the Pierce Chief of Intelligence, Hogan said grandly. And I know everything, or almost everything. What I don't know, Richard, is whether these damn frogs are going to use the East Road or the West. So Wellington insists we have to cover both, or rather the Spaniards will block the East Road, and you and your merry men will guard the West. Here. He stabbed a finger down, and Sharp peered at the map to see a tiny mark close to the French frontier and next to it, in Hogan's extravagant handwriting, the name Irati. You like Irati, Colonel Hogan said. It's a nothing place, Richard. Hovels and misery, that's all it is, and all it will ever be, but that's where you're going for Christmas. Because maybe the French were going there. Wellington's victory at Vittoria had thrown their armies out of Spain, but a handful of French forts still remained south of the frontier, and Hogan's agents had learned that the garrison at Akagavia was about to attempt an escape back into France. The garrison planned to march at Christmas in the hope that their enemies would be too bloated with beef and wine to fight. But Hogan had got wind of their plans and was now setting his snares on the only two routes that the escaping French could use. One, the eastern road, was by far the easier, for it entered France through a low pass, and Hogan guessed it was that route that the French would choose. But there was a second road, a tight, hard, steep road, and that had to be blocked as well. And so the Prince of Wales' own volunteers, Sharp's regiment, would climb into the hills and spend their Christmas at a place of hovels and misery called Arati. As over a thousand men in the fort at Okagavia, 
Hogan told Sharp. And we don't want Boney to get those men back, Richard. You have to stop them. If they use the Western Road, sir. Which they probably won't, Hogan said comfortingly. But if they do, Richard, stop them. Kill me some frogs for Christmas. That's why you joined the army, isn't it? To kill frogs. So go and do it. I want you out of here in an hour. In truth, Richard Sharp had not joined the army to kill frogs. He had joined because he was hungry and on the run from the constables, and because once a man had taken the shilling and pulled on the king's coat, he was reckoned safe from the law. And so Private Richard Sharp had joined the 33, fought with them in Flanders and in India, where at Assay, a bloody battlefield between two rivers where a small British army had trounced a vast Indian horde, he had become an officer. That was almost ten years ago now and he had spent a good many of those years fighting the French in Portugal and Spain. Only now he fought in a dark green coat, for he was a rifleman, though by an accident of war he now found himself commanding a battalion of red coats. They had once been called the South Essex, but now they were the Prince of Wales' own volunteers, though on this dank gray morning they were anything but willing. They were comfortable in their Spanish billets, they liked the local girls, and none were of a mind to go soldiering in a cold Spanish winter. Sharp ignored their displeasure. Men did not join the army to be comfortable. They marched on the hour, 422 men swinging east out of the town and down into the valley. It had begun to rain heavily, filling the small ditches that edged the fields and flooding the furrows left in the road by the big guns. No one else in the army was moving, just Sharp's regiment that was going to plug a gap in the high mountains to stop the French escaping. Not that Sharp believed he would fight this Christmas. Even Hogan was not certain that the Akagavia garrison would march. And if they did, they would probably choose the eastern road, the main road. So all Sharp expected was a long march and a cold Christmas. But King George wanted him to be at Arati, so to Arati he would go and God help the frogs if they did the same. Colonel Jean Goudin watched as the tricolor was lowered. The fort at Akagavia that he had commanded for four years was being abandoned, and it hurt. It was another failure, and his life had been nothing but failure. Even the fort at Akagavia was a failure, for, as Goudin could see, it guarded nothing. True, it dominated a road in the mountains, but the road had never been used to bring supplies from France, and so it had never been haunted by the dreaded partisans who harried all the other French garrisons in Spain. Time and again, Gooden had pointed this out to his superiors. But somewhere in Paris, there was a pin stuck into a map of Spain, and the pin represented the garrison of Akagavia, and no one had been willing to surrender that pin prick until now, when some bureaucrat had suddenly remembered the fort's existence and realized that it held a thousand good men who were needed to defend the homeland. Those men now made ready for their escape. Three hundred were Goudin's garrison, and the others were fugitives who had taken refuge in Okagavia after the disaster at Vittoria. Some of those refugees were dragoons, but most were infantrymen from the 75th Regiment who paraded in the fort's courtyard beneath their eagle and under the eye of their irascible chef de bataillon, Colonel Caillou. Behind the 75th, clustered about two horse-drawn wagons was a crowd of women and children. Those damn women aren't coming with us, Caillou said. He was mounted on a black charger that he curbed besides Goudin's horse. I thought we agreed to abandon the women. I didn't agree. Caillou snorted, then glared at the shivering women. They were mostly the wives and girlfriends of Goudin's garrison, and between them the ninety women had almost as many children some of them no more than babes in arms. The Spaniards, he snapped. Not all of them, Goudin said. Some are French. But French or Spanish, Caillou insisted, they will slow us down. The essence of success, Goudin, is to march fast, audacity, speed. There lies safety. We cannot take women and children. If they stay, Goudin said stubbornly, they will be killed. That's the war, Goudin, that's the war, Caillou declared. In war, the weak die. We are soldiers of France, Goudin said stiffly, and we do not leave women and children to die. They march with us. 
Jong Gudan knew that maybe all of them, soldiers, women and children alike, might die because of that decision. But he could not abandon these Spanish women who had found themselves French husbands and given birth to half French babies. If they were left here, then the partisans would find them. They would be called traitors. They would be tortured and they would die. No, Gudan thought. He could not just leave them. Amalia is pregnant, he added, nodding towards an ammunition cart on which a woman lay swathed in gray army blankets. I don't care if she's the Virgin Mary, Caillou exploded. We cannot afford to take women and children. Caillou saw that his words were having no effect on the gray-haired Colonel Goudin, and the older man's stubbornness inflamed Caillou. My God, Goudin, no wonder they call you a failure. You go too far, Colonel, Goudin said stiffly. He outranked Caillou, but only by virtue of having been a colonel longer than the fiery infantryman. I go too far. Caillou spat in derision. But at least I care more for France than for a pack of snivelling women. If you lose my eagle, Goudin, he pointed to the tricolor flag beneath its statuette of the eagle, I will have you shot. It was a small thing, an eagle, hardly bigger than a man's spread hand. But the gilded bronze birds were granted personally by Napoleon, and each held in its clawed grip the whole honor of France. To lose an eagle was the greatest disaster a regiment could imagine, for the emperor's eagle was France. Lose it, Caillou said savagely, and I'll personally command the firing squad that kills you. Goudin did not bother to reply, but just kicked his horse towards the gate. He felt an immense sadness. Caillou was right, he thought. He was a failure. It had all begun in India, thirteen years before, when he had been a military advisor to the Tipu Sultan, ruler of Mysore, and Goudin had held such high hopes that with French help and advice that Tipu could defeat the British in southern India, but instead the British had won. The Tipu's capital, Seringapatam, had fallen, and Goudin had been a prisoner for a year until he was exchanged for a British officer held prisoner by the French. He had returned to France then and thought that his career would revive, but instead it had been one long failure. He had not received one promotion in all those years, but had gone from one misfortune to the next, until now he was the commander of a useless fort in a bleak landscape where France was losing a war. And if he could escape successfully, that would be a victory, especially if he could take Caillou's precious eagle safe across the Pyrenees. But he doubted that even an eagle was worth the life of so many women and children, and that he knew all too well was his handicap. The emperor would sacrifice a hundred thousand women and children to preserve the glory of France, but Goudin could not do it. He reached the fort's gate and nodded to the sergeant of the guard. You can open up, he said, and once we've left, sergeant, light the fuses. The women, sir, the sergeant asked anxiously, they are coming? They are coming, Pierre. I promised, didn't I? The dragoons left first. It was dusk. Gooden planned to march all night in the hope that by dawn he would have left any partisans far behind. Until now, he had hardly been aware of the fearsome Spanish guerrilleros, but those savage men had few French enemies left in Spain, and they were now closing on the remaining enemy fortresses like vultures, scenting death. Goudin had spread a rumor that he intended to march his garrison to join the beleaguered French troops in the fortress city of Pamplona, and he hoped that might keep the partisans away from the roads that led northwards. But he doubted the rumor would work. His best hope lay in marching at night, and God help any of his men or women who could not keep up, for they would face a terrible, slow death. Some would be burned alive, some flayed, some... But no, it did not bear thinking about. It was not war as Goudin understood it. It was mere butchery. And what galled Goudin most was that the guerrilleros were only doing to the French what the French had done to the Spaniards. The infantry marched through the gate behind their precious eagle. The women followed. Goudin stayed as the sergeant lit the fuses, then he spurred away from his doomed fort. He paused a half mile up the road and turned to watch as the fire in the fuses burned towards the deep charges set in the fort's magazines. He waited 
wondering if the fuses had extinguished themselves, staring at the small fort that had been his home for so long. And then the night blossomed red, and a moment later the sound of the explosions punched through the damp darkness. Flame and smoke boiled above the fort's ramparts as the heavy guns were tumbled from their emplacements. Scraps, trailing sparks like comets, arced across the glasses to start small fires in the winter grass. And then there was just silence and flame. Akagavia had been gutted. Another failure, Gudan thought, watching the great fire rage. If my eagle is lost, Colonel Caillou had ridden back to join Gudan and was still furious that the women had been allowed to join the column. I shall blame you, Gudin. So pray that the British have not blocked the road, Gudan answered. The fort was a dark mass of stone now, in which the fire glowed bloody red. It's partisans I worry about, not the British, Caillou sneered. If the British are on the road, then General Picard will come from behind and they will be squeezed to death. For that was the plan. General Picard was marching south from saint jean pied de port he would climb the French side of the Pyrenees to make sure that the frontier pass was open for Goudin's men, and all Goudin needed to do was survive the 40 kilometers of torturous winter road that twisted up from Akagavia to the pass where General Picard waited. At a place of misery in the mountains, a place called Irati. It's not such a bad place, Sharp said, and it was true that in the fading evening light, Irati had a certain picturesque quality. It was a village of small stone houses, little more than huts, with stone roofs on which moss grew. The houses lay in a sheltered valley at the junction of two high streams and were clustered about a small church in a big tavern, the Casa Alta, that provided shelter for any folks traveling the high pass. Can't see why anyone would want to live here, though, Sharp added. They're mostly shepherds, Captain Peter Dallenbord said. Shepherds, eh? Sharp said. That's fitting for Christmas, isn't it? I seem to rec recollect something about shepherds, shepherds and wise men, isn't that right? Quite right, sir, Dallenbord said. He could never quite get used to the idea that Sharp had received no education at all, other than being taught to read while he was a prisoner in India, and what he had picked up over his years in the army. A fellow used to read the Christmas story to us in the founding home, Sharp remembered. A big fat parson he was with funny whiskers. Looked a bit like that sergeant who caught a belly full of canister at Santa Manca. We had to sit and listen, and if we yawned, the bugger used to jump off the platform and clout us round the face with the holy book. One minute, it was all peace on earth, and the next, you were flying across the floor with a thick ear. But at least you learned your Bible stories, Dellenbord said. I learned how to thieve, Sharp said cheerfully, and how to slit a throat and cut a purse. Useful lessons daily. As for the Bible stories, I learned most of those in India. I worked with a Scottish colonel who was a Bible thumper. Sharp smiled at the memory. He was walking north, climbing the road that led from Irati towards the nearby French frontier. He had already found a place south of the village where his battalion could stop the escaping garrison, and now he wanted to be certain that no frogs were lurking in his rear. You liked India? Delambord asked. It's a bit hot, Sharp said. And the food could turn you inside out quicker than a musket ball, but yes, I, I liked it. I served under the best colonel I ever had in India. A Scotsman? Dellenbord asked. Not McCandless, no, Sharp laughed. He was a good fellow, McCandless, but a bit fussy, and his, his Bible thumping was a bloody bore. Now, this man was a crapaud. It's, it's a long story, Daly, and I, I don't want to bore you, but I served with the enemy for a bit in India. On purpose, it was. On purpose, Dellenbord sounded surprised. All official, Sharp said, and I ended up serving a fellow called Colonel Goudin. He was very good to me, Colonel Goudin. He even wanted me to go to France with him, and I, I can't say I wasn't tempted. Truly. Goudin was a nice fellow, Sharp said, but it was all a long time ago, Daly, a very long time ago. And those words signaled that he would say no more of it. D'Alembourg wished Sharp would tell the whole story of Colonel Goudin, but he knew it was hopeless trying to get reminiscences out of Major Sharp once he had declared it was all a long time ago. D'Alembourg had seen men try to learn how Sharp had taken the French eagle at Talavera, but Sharp would just shrug and say that anyone could have done it, 
It was just luck, really. He just happened to be there, and the thing was looking for a new owner. <laughs> like hell, d'Alembourg thought. Sharp was quite simply the best soldier he had ever known or ever would know. Sharp stopped at the head of the pass and pulled a telescope from a pocket of his green jacket. The telescope's outer barrel had an ivory cover and an inscribed gold plate that read, in French, to Joseph, King of Spain and the Indies, from his brother, Napoleon, Emperor of France. Another story that Sharp would not tell. Now, he trained the expensive glass northwards to search the misted slopes across the border. He saw rocks, stunted trees, and the glint of a cold stream tumbling from a high place. And beyond the stream, a fading succession of mountain peaks. A chill, damp, and hard land, he thought, and no place to send soldiers at Christmas time. Not a frog to be seen, Sharp said happily, and was about to lower the glass when he saw a movement in a cleft of rock on a distant slope. The road ran through the cleft, and he held his breath as he stared at the narrow gap. What is it? Delenbord asked. Sharp did not answer. He just gazed at the split in the grey stone from which an army was suddenly appearing. At least it looked like an army. Rank after rank of infantry trudging northwards in dun grey coats, and they were coming from France. He handed the telescope to Delenbord. Tell me what you see, Daly. Delenbord aimed the glass, then swore quietly. I guess a whole brigade, sir. Coming from the wrong direction, too, Sharp said. Without the telescope, he could not see the distant army, but he could guess what they were about. The garrison would be escaping on this road, and the French brigade had been sent to make sure the frontier was open for them. They'll not make it this far tonight, Sharp said. The sun had already sunk beneath the western peaks, and the night shadows were stretching fast. But they'll be here tomorrow, Dallenbord said nervously. Aye, tomorrow, Christmas Eve, Sharp said. An awful lot of them, Dallenbord said. That's true. Sharp took back the glass and stared at the approaching French. No artillery, he said. No cavalry, just infantry. He watched through the fading light until he was satisfied that there were no cavalry or cannons approaching. Punchins, Daly, he said. That's what we need, punchins. Punchins, sir? Delambord gazed at Sharp as though the Major had gone mad. A tavern in Arati, Daly, has to be full of barrels. I want them here tonight, all of them. Because tomorrow there would be an enemy behind, an enemy in front, a road to hold, and a battle to win at Christmas time. General Maximilien Picard was a disgruntled man. His brigade was late. He had expected to be at Arati by midday, but his men had marched like a herd of spavin goats, and by nightfall they still had one steep-sided valley to cross and another precipitous hill to climb, and so he was forced to bivouac a half-day's march from his destination. The camp was a deep, damp valley, bleak as hell, and he could see that his troops were miserable and that pleased the general. Most of his men were conscripts who needed to be toughened, and a night among the cold rocks would help scour the mother's milk from their gullets. The only fuel for fires was a few stunted trees in the hollows where the winter's first snow lay drifted. But most of the conscripts had no idea how to light a fire from damp, tough wood, and so they just suffered. Their only food was the rings of hard-baked bread they carried on strings about their necks, but at least the stream offered plenty of clean, cold water. In the other fortnight, Picard said, and it will be frozen. As bad as Russia, Major Santon, his chief of staff, commented. Nothing was as bad as Russia, Picard said, though in truth the general had rather enjoyed the Russian campaign. He was among the few men who had done well there, but Picard was a man accustomed to success, not like Colonel Goudin, whose garrison he now marched to rescue. He's a useless piece of grisel, Goudin, Picard said. I've never met the man, Santon said. Let's hope you meet him tomorrow, but knowing Goudin, he'll mess things up. Picard leaned close to the fire to light his pipe, and the flames showed the hard lines on his tanned skin. He sucked smoke, then leaned back. I knew Goudin way back. He promised well then, but ever since India... Picard shrugged. 
He's unlucky. That's what Gudani is. He's unlucky. And you know what the emperor says about luck. It's, it's the only thing a soldier needs, luck. Luck can turn, Santon observed. <laughs> Not for Gudin, Picard said. The man's doomed. He means well. He knows his business, but fate doesn't like him. If the 75th hadn't taken refuge with him, we'd have left him to rot in Spain. Santon looked towards the dark southern heights that marked the frontier. Let's hope the British aren't waiting for him up there. Picard sneered. Let's hope they are. What would they say? One battalion? Two? You think we can't blast our way through a pair of goddamn battalions? The thought of fighting made him smile. We'd put our grenadiers up front and let them shoot some roast beefs for breakfast. Conscript grenadiers? Saturn observed quietly. Picard growled and looked sour, but Saturn was right. Of course, he could dress a man in uniform, but that did not make him a soldier, and Picard's men were young, frightened, and inexperienced. These were not like the soldiers he had marched into Russia. Those had been real men, hard as iron, but not hard enough for a Russian winter. The British won't bother us, he said dismissively. You'll find the Rati empty. What's there? Nothing, Santon said. A few shepherds. So it's mutton and shepherd girls for Christmas, Picard said. A last taste of Spain, eh? The general smiled in anticipation. Irati might be a miserable hovel on the frontier, but it was an enemy hovel, and that meant plunder. And Picard still rather hoped there would be a few roast beefs guarding the small village, for he reckoned his conscripts needed a fight. Most were too young to shave, and they needed a taste of blood before Wellington's army spilled across the Pyrenees into the fields of France. Give a young soldier the taste of victory, Picard reckoned, and it gave him a hunger for more. That was the trouble with Colonel Goudin. He had become used to defeat, but Picard was a winner. He was a short man, like the Emperor, and just as ruthless, a soldier of France who had led a brigade through the slaughter snows of Russia and left a trail of dead Cossacks to mark his passing. And in the morning, if any Rospiefs dared oppose him, he would show them how a veteran of the Russian campaign made war. He would give them a Christmas to remember, a Christmas of blood in a high, hard place, for he was General Maximilien Picard, and he did not lose. Doesn't seem right somehow, Sharp said, fighting at Christmas. Tomorrow's Christmas, sir, Harper said, as if that made today's fight more acceptable. If we do fight today, Sharp said, keep an eye on young Nichols. I don't want to lose another ensign. He seems a nice enough wee lad, Harper said, and I'll make sure he gets home to his mother. Ensign Nichols was now standing at the center of Sharp's line, beneath the regiment's twin colors. The Prince of Wales' own volunteers were fifty paces back from the frontier that was marked only by a cairn of stones, and just far enough back so that any Frenchman coming from the south could not see them beyond the crest. Behind them, on the Spanish side of the frontier, the pass descended gently towards the village while in front of the battalion the slope fell steeply away. The road zigzagged oval up that slope, and the enemy brigade would have a foul time climbing into Sharp's muskets. It could be like shooting rats in a pit, Harper said happily, and so it would, but the enemy brigade could still be a nuisance. Its very presence meant Sharp had to keep his battalion on the frontier, leaving only a piquet to guard the road south of the village where he expected to see the escaping French garrison. Captain Smith commanded that piquet, and he would give Sharp warning if that garrison came into sight. But what would Sharp do then? If he marched his men south, then the French brigade would climb the slope and take him in the rear, while if he stayed on this high crest, the garrison of troops would appear in the valley behind him. Either way, he would be caught between two larger forces, and he just had to hope that the garrison did not come today. There was still no sign of the French who had camped in the deep valley beyond the frontier. They would be bitterly cold by now, cold and frightened and damp and unhappy, while Sharp's men were as comfortable as they could be in this miserable place. All his battalion except the sentries had spent the night inside Arati's fire-warmed houses, where they had made a decent breakfast from twice-baked bread, sour salt beef, and strong tea. Sharp stamped his feet and blew on his cold hands. When would the French come? He was not really in any hurry, for the longer they delayed, the more hope he had of keeping them out of the village all day. 
but he had a soldier's impatience to get the grim business done. Grim, at least for the French, for Sharp had set them a trap on the road. That road twisted down from the frontier into a small hanging comb that overlooked the deeper valley where the French had spent their uncomfortable night. And in that higher valley, which the dawn now touched with a gray damp light, there were 21 big wine puncheons. The barrels were arranged in seven groups of three, and each group blocked the narrow track up which the French must come. There were 21 barrels, and above them, hidden among the rocks, were the 16 riflemen who, like Sharp, were now enrolled in the Prince of Wales' own volunteers. The French hated riflemen. They did not use the rifle themselves, reckoning that it took too long to load, but Sharp loved the weapon. It might be slow in battle, but it could kill at five times the range of a smoothbore musket, and he had more than once seen a handful of riflemen turn a battle's fate. Sergeant Major Harper was commanding the riflemen in the lower valley, and Sharp knew they would fight with terrible skill. Sharp turned and stared south into Spain. He could not see Irati, for the village was well over a mile away, and its piquettes were a half mile further off still, and he suddenly worried that he would not hear Captain Smith's warning shots. But it was too late to change the arrangements now. So stop worrying, he told himself. No point in fretting what you cannot change. Enemy, sir, Delambroad said softly, and Sharp wheeled back to gaze down the road. The French had come. Not many yet, just a half company of grenadiers, the elite of the enemy infantry. Sharp could tell they were grenadiers because they wore high bearskin hats with a yellow grenade badge, though none, he saw through his telescope, flaunted the high red plume on their hats. French grenadiers were very protective of that plume, and on campaign they liked to keep it in a leather tube attached to their bayonet sling. It was only brought out for formal parades or to impress women, and they fought without it, just as curiously they fought without grenades. Sharp had only ever seen grenades aboard warships, and no wonder, for they were fiddly to light, and being mostly made of glass, fragile to transport. These grenadiers would fight with muskets and bayonets, but they were up against fifteen rifles and twenty-one wine barrels. Thirty, he counted the enemy as they appeared. Forty, forty-five, sixty, <laughs> all grenadiers, Daly. Sending their best up front, are they? Seems that way, Sharp said still gazing through the captured telescope. The Frenchmen had seen the barrels now, and they were puzzled by them. They had stopped and seemed to be arguing amongst themselves. Not the word we have, Sharp said. They'll be hoping it's free wine for Christmas, Delambord said. Some of the French grenadiers stared up the hill, but they could see no enemy, for the Prince of Wales' own volunteers were well hidden behind the crest, and Sharp and Delambord were concealed by the frontier cairn. The enemy still did not advance, but at last an officer, a sword scabbard, slim at his side, walked towards the waiting puncheons. It's his lucky day, Sharp said. The grenadier stayed back as the officer approached the strange obstacle. He was cautious, as any man would be on the Spanish frontier, but the barrels looked innocent enough. He stooped to the nearest, sniffed at the bung, then drew his sword and worked the tip of its blade into the cork plug. He levered the tight bung free, then stooped to sniff again. He's found the wine, Sharp said. The officer turned and called to the waiting grenadiers who, assured that only barrels of cheap Spanish tinto barred their path, surged forward. More soldiers were appearing over the lower crest now, and they too rushed to join in the unexpected booty. Men stabbed their bayonets at the bungs of the barrels, then tipped them over so the wine poured into their empty canteens. A small crowd gathered round the first three barrels, and another group, even larger, went to take possession of the second line of barrels. Well, what they are about to receive, Sharp said. Two of the barrels in the second group contained nothing but stones, but the third, the middle barrel, held gunpowder from sharp spare ammunition. That powder half filled the puncheon and was mixed with scraps of iron and small sharp stones, while above it, balanced on a stave that Rifleman Hagman had carefully nailed into place, was a coiled strip of burning slow match. None of the grenadiers noticed the small holes that had been drilled into the barrel to feed air to the fire, nor did they see the tiny wisps of smoke sifting from the burning fuse. They just anticipated wine, and so they prized out the loosened bung and kicked the barrel over. 
For a second, Sharp thought the trap had failed. Then, suddenly, the narrow valley vanished in a cloud of gray-white powder smoke that was pierced with livid flame. The smoke churned in a small comb, hiding the awful carnage made by the explosion. Then, as the damp wind began to carry the powder smoke northwards, the thunder rolled up the slope. The sound was like the slamming of hell's gates, and it was magnified by the echo that beat back from the valley's far side. A half dozen grenadiers were dead. One, gutted to the backbone, was sprawled on the road where a score of other men were bleeding and staggering. Then the sound faded, and there was just a strange silence in the hills broken by the screams of the wounded. Poor fellows, Dallenbord said, for the smoke was clearing and he could see the bodies scattered on the road, and then the riflemen opened fire. Sharp's riflemen did not miss their mark at that close range. They fired from behind the rocks high on either side of the small valley, and first they picked off the surviving officers. Then they shot at the sergeants, and by the time each green jacket had fired two rounds, the French had vanished from the small valley. They had fled back over its lip, leaving behind a dozen dead and two score of wounded men. The battle for Herati had begun. In one way, Colonel Jean Goutin had been untypically lucky, for not one partisan had troubled his column on its dark road north. But in every other way, his usual ill fortune had prevailed. First, one of the dragoon horses had stumbled on a frozen rut in the road and broken its leg. By itself, it was no great accident, and the poor beast was put out of its misery swiftly enough. But in the dark, the commotion caused a long delay. The carcass was finally hauled from the road, and the column had trudged on only to have the dragoon vanguard take a wrong turning a few kilometers further on. That, at least, was not Goudin's fault, any more than the injured horse had been his fault. But it was typical of his luck, and it was almost dawn by the time the column had turned itself about and found the right track winding up towards the high pass. By then, Goudin had surrendered his horse to one of his lieutenants, who had a fever and could hardly walk. Colonel Caillou was fuming at the delay. He had never, he claimed, in all his service as a soldier, seen such ineptitude. A half-wit could do better than Gaudin. We are supposed to be at the pass by midday, he insisted, and we shall be lucky to be there by nightfall. Gaudin ignored the colonel's ranting. There was nothing to be done except press on and be thankful that the guerrilleros were asleep in their beds. In three days' time, Gaudin reflected, he would be back at a depot in France. He would be safe. And so long as no British troops waited at the frontier, he should save Caillou's eagle and so spare himself the firing squad. It was just after dawn that the next accident occurred. The column was dragging two wagons, one carrying the heavily pregnant Maria and the second loaded with what small baggage the garrison had managed to rescue from the fort. The front axle of that second wagon broke and suddenly the horses were dragging stumps of splintering wood across the rutted road. Goudin sighed. There was nothing for it but to abandon the wagon with all its precious possessions, small things, but the property of men who owned little. He did let his men rifle the baggage to retrieve what they could carry. And all the while, Caillou cursed him and said the time was wasting. And Goudin knew that was true, but again, it was not his fault. So he rescued what he could, then ordered the vehicle to be shoved off the road. With it went his books, not many, but all of them dear to Goudin but too heavy to carry. He did manage to salvage his diaries, including the two volumes he had written when he was in India and had believed he could drive the British out of Mysore. But the Redcoats had won, and nothing had been the same since. Goudin often thought of India. When he had been there, he had often cursed the flies and the heat, but since returning to Europe, he had come to regret leaving. He missed the smells, the color, the mystery... He missed the gaudy panoply of Indian armies marching. He missed the sun and the savagery of the monsoon. Most of all, he missed his youthful optimism. In India, he had possessed a future, but after it, none. And sometimes, when he was feeling sorry for himself, he blamed it all on one young man whom he had liked, an Englishman called Sharp. It had been Sharp who caused that first great defeat, though Goudin had never blamed Sharp for he had recognized that Private Richard Sharp had been a natural soldier. How the emperor would have loved Sharp. So much luck. Now there was another Sharp, an officer in Spain whose name haunted the French, and Goudin sometimes wondered if it was the same man, though that seemed unlikely, for few British officers came from the ranks, and besides, this Sharp was a rifleman, and Goudin's Sharp had been a redcoat. 
Yet sometimes Goudin secretly hoped that it was the same man, for he had liked young Richard Sharp, though in truth he suspected that young Sharp was long dead. Not many Europeans survived India. The fever got them if an enemy did not. Goudin walked on, musing on India and trying to ignore Colonel Caillou's insults. The pregnant girl was in pain and crying, and this garrison surgeon, a fastidious Parisian who had hated serving in the Pyrenees, told Goudin the girl was doomed. She can't give birth, naturally, he asserted, so it's better just to shoot her. Her bawling just upsets men. Is that your medical opinion? Goudin asked, but angrily. Shoot her? Put her out of her misery. Why can't she give birth naturally? Because the baby is sideways, the doctor said. It isn't head first. We, we dive into the world, Colonel. We don't come sideways. So cut her open. Ha <laughs> Here, the doctor laughed. And if I cut her, she'd die. And if I don't cut her, she'd die. In these circumstances, Colonel, the best medical instrument is a pistol. Just keep her alive as far as Irati, good aunt said tiredly. And there you can operate. <sighs> if she lives that long, the surgeon muttered. And just then, a dull rumble came from the mountains ahead. It sounded like distant thunder, but there were no storm clouds over the peaks. And a heartbeat after the rumble had faded, the small wind brought the spiteful crackle of musketry. You see? Caillou spurred back down the column with a look of triumph. There's enemy ahead. We don't know that, Goudin said. That c could have been from anywhere. They are waiting for us, Caillou said, pointing dramatically towards the hills. And if we'd abandoned the women, we'd be there already. It's your doing, Godin, I promise. If my eagle is lost, the emperor will know it's your doing. You must tell the emperor whatever you wish, Godin said in resignation. So leave the women here now. Leave them, Caillou insisted. March to the guns, Colonel. Get there before dark. I will not leave the women, Godin said. I will not leave them, and we shall be at Rati long before nightfall. It is not so far now. Caillou spat in disgust and spurred ahead. Colonel Goudin sighed and walked on. His heels were blistering, but he would not retrieve his horse, for he knew the lieutenant's need was greater than his. Nor would he abandon his men's women, and so he just kept going and tried to blot out the awful haunting moans of the pregnant girl. He was not a prayerful man, but as he climbed towards the distant sound of the guns, Colonel Goudin did pray. He prayed that God would send him a victory, just one small victory, so that his career would not end in failure or a firing squad. A Christmas miracle, that was all he asked. Just one small miracle to set against a lifetime of defeat. General Maximilien Picard bowled his way through the panicked troops to stand at the mouth of the small valley. He could see the dead grenadiers, the smashed barrels, and beyond them, more barrels waiting in the road. A rifle bullet snapped past his head, but Picard ignored the threat. He was charmed. There was no one alive who could spoil that luck. Santon, he snapped. Sir? Major Santon resisted the urge to crouch. One company up here. They are to destroy the barrels with valley fire. You understand? Yes, sir. And while they're doing that, send the vote de guerre up the slopes. The general pointed to where puffs of grey-white smoke betrayed the position of the riflemen. He did not know they were riflemen, and if he had known, he might have shown more caution. Instead, he believed the ambush must have been set by partisans. But whoever it was, they would soon be chased out of their lairs by the French light infantry. Do it now, Picard snapped. We don't have all day. He turned away, and a bullet plucked at his coat, flicking it out like a banner caught by the wind. The car turned back, looked to find the newest patch of musket smoke, and lifted a finger to it. Bastards, he said as he walked away. Bastards! Who would now get a lesson for Christmas. Bugler! Sharp called, and the 13-year-old boy came running out of the battalion to stand behind his major. Sound the retreat, Sharp ordered, and saw a Peter Dallin board left a quizzical eyebrow. Any minute now. Sharp explained. The frogs will send their Veltiger up the valley sides, and there's no point in our lads hanging around while they do that. They've done their damage. The bugler took a deep breath, then blew hard. The call was a triple call of nine notes, the first eight stuttering on one note, and the last flying high up the scale. 
The sound of the bugle echoed from the distant hills, and Sharp, gazing through his telescope, saw the cloaked French general turn back. Again, lad, Sharp told the bugler. The bugle call was sending two messages. First, it was telling Harper's riflemen to abandon their positions and climb back to the ridge. But it was also telling the French that they faced an enemy more formidable than a handful of partisans. They were facing trained infantry, veteran troops, and when Sharp was certain that the French general was staring up at the ridge in an effort to catch sight of the bugle, he turned and shouted at the Prince of Wales' own volunteers, Tellian! By the right! Forward! A pause. March! They stamped forward in perfect order, a line of men two ranks deep beneath their bright colors. To the right was the king's color, the flag of Britain fringed with yellow tassels, while to the left was the regimental color, yellow as the sun, and blazoned with the names of the battles where the Prince of Wales' own volunteers had fought. In its center was the regimental badge, a chained French eagle that boasted of the day when Sharp and Harper, in a bloody valley wreathed in smoke, had taken an enemy color. Tellion! Sharp shouted as they reached the ridge's crest. Halt! Fix bayonets! Sharp was putting on a display for the French. The enemy had been bloodied, they had been panicked, and now they faced a long, steep climb up a bare, cold hill to where they could see the red coats of Britain and the long glitter of 17-inch bayonets. Ensign Nichols came to stand by Sharp. What are we doing, sir? We're giving the frogs a formal invitation, Mr. Nichols. Seeing if they're brave enough to come up and dance. Will they? I doubt it, lad, Sharp said. I doubt it. Why not, sir? Because they're about to be given a demonstration, lad, that's why. Sergeant Major! Sir? Harper acknowledged, breathless from his climb up the hill. Three rounds, Sergeant Major. Platoon fire, and I want it fast. Yes, sir. The range was much too great for a smoothbore musket, but Sharp did not have a mind to kill any more Frenchmen today. He had already killed too many for his liking. Christmas should be peace on earth, not broken bodies on a hard road. So now he would show the French exactly what waited for them at the hill's top. He would show them that they faced veterans who could fire their muskets faster than any other troops on earth. He would show them that to climb the hill was to enter hell, and with any luck they would decline his invitation. Stand back! Mr. Nichols, Sharp said, and steered the ensign back through the waiting ranks. Now, Sergeant Major! Harper ordered the men to remove their bayonets that had only been slotted into place for display and which hampered men loading muskets. Load, he called, and the men dropped the musket butts to the ground and tore open cartridges. This was the essential skill, the ability to load a musket fast, and Sharp had trained his men relentlessly. He now counted the seconds in his head and had reached 14 when Harper called that the battalion was ready. Platoon fire, Sharp called. Present! The muskets went up to the men's shoulders, and to the French in the valley below, it seemed as if the whole redcoat battalion took a quarter turn to the right. Number four, company, Sharp called. On your command! Four company, Captain Bitten called. Five company. He was the senior captain of the two companies and so commanded both when, as now, they worked together. He paused a heartbeat. Ah! The two center companies fired together. The muskets slammed back into their shoulders and a dirty cloud of powder smoke spat across the crest. No more orders were given, but as soon as the center companies had fired, the platoons on either side pulled their triggers. Each company was split into two platoons, and each platoon waited for the one inside them to fire before firing themselves. And to the watching French, it must have looked as though the smoke was rippling out along the high red line. But any troops could fire one round in a pretty ripple. What would put fear into the French was the speed with which the second bullet was fired, and Sharp noted with approval that the center companies were all reloaded before the ripple of musket fire had reached the battalion's outer flanks. Those flanks fired, and within a heartbeat the two inner platoons of the center companies had fired again, and again the ripple spread outwards as the men in the center dropped their muskets' heavy butts into the stony ground and ripped the top from new cartridges with their teeth. The second staggered volley of musket balls whistled out into the void, and the third followed without a pause. It had been a marvelous display, the best infantry in the world showing what they did best. And if that promise of slaughter did not give the enemy pause, 
then nothing would. But Picard was not a man to heed a warning, and Sharp, watching through the thinning musket smoke, saw that the French were not retreating to the deeper valley, and just then, far to the south, from where the picket watched the road leading into Spain, a musket fired and Sharp span round, and knew the other enemy was coming. Captain is out on board, Sharp shouted. Sir, you take over here, Daly, Sharp said, and I'll take your horse. The French brigade was forming a column, which could only mean one thing, that they planned to attack straight up the hill. Though before advancing, their leading rank fired musket volleys at the 15 remaining barrels that blocked the road. None of the barrels contained firing gunpowder, for Sharp had only possessed a limited supply, but the French were not to know that. Their volleys riddled the barrels while their skirmishers climbed the small valley's side to chase away riflemen who had long retreated. It would take an hour, Sharp reckoned, before the threatening brigade was in a fit state to advance. And when they did, he doubted it would be with much enthusiasm, for the display of musketry had warned them of what waited. But another thousand Frenchmen were coming from the south in a desperate attempt to escape from Spain, and those men knew that they must fight through the pass if they were ever to reach home, and their desperation could make those thousand men far more dangerous than the brigade. Sharp rode back through the village to where a piquet watched the enemy approaching from the south. They're still a long way off, sir, Captain Smith reported nervously, worried that he had summoned Sharp too soon. You did the right thing, Sharp reassured him as he drew out his telescope. What's happening back there, sir? Smith asked. We showed the frogs a trick or two, but they still seem to want to fight. But don't worry, they won't be spending their Christmas here. He could see the valley and the approaching French column now. There were mounted dragoons up front, infantry behind, one wagon, no guns, and a crowd of women and children. That's good, Sharp said quietly. Good, sir? They're bringing their women, Captain, and they won't want them hurt, will they? Might even persuade them to surrender. Sharp paused, his eye caught by a metallic gleam above the infantry's dark shackles. And they've got an eagle, Sharp said excitedly. That would make a nice Christmas present for the battalion, wouldn't it, a French eagle? I could fancy that. He collapsed the glass and wondered how much time he had. The column was still a good two hours marching away, which should be enough. Just watch them, he told Smith. Then he pulled himself back into D'Alembourg's saddle and rode back to the frontier. It was all a question of timing now. If the brigade attacked the hill at the same time as the garrison approached the village, then he was in trouble. But when he was back at the northern ridge, he saw to his relief that the enemy had already cleared the road of barrels and that their Voltigeurs were spreading out on the slope to herald the attack. The job of the Voltigeurs was to advance in a loose skirmish line and harass the redcoats with musket fire. A good skirmish attack could pick off enemy officers and abrade confidence in the waiting ranks, and to frustrate the French light infantry, Sharp sent his own skirmishers into battle. Mr. Dallamport, light company out. Pick off those Voltigeurs. The light company, a mix of riflemen and redcoats with muskets, scattered down the hill and took up positions behind rocks. The men would fight in pairs, one man firing, while his companion loaded, and the riflemen would concentrate their bullets on officers and sergeants. They waited until at last the French drummers sounded the pas de charge, and the Voltigeurs, already ahead of the column, pressed upwards to dislodge D'Alembourg's light company. The first rifles fired, and a moment later the muskets joined in to dot the hillside with smoke. The French Voltigeurs fired back, but Sharp's men were sheltered by the boulders, and none, so far as Sharp could see, was hit. A French officer was on his knees, clutching his belly. Another was shouting his men up the hill, and then he, too, was hit by a bullet. Amateurs, Sharp said caustically. The Voltigeurs were not forcing home their attack, but trying to stay out of range of the deadly rifles. He stared at the Frenchmen through the glass and reckoned they were nothing but children snatched from a depot and marched to war. It was cruel. The column was advancing now, pressing close behind the nervous Voltigeurs. It looked formidable, but columns always did. This one was twenty files wide and thirty-one ranks deep, a great, solid block of men who had been ordered to climb an impossible slope into a gale of fire. It would be murder, not war. 
but it was the French commander who was doing the murdering. The column lost its cohesion as it tried to cut across the corners of the zigzagging road and around the splintered remnants of the barrels. Sergeants and officers shoved the men back into place, and the drummers beat them on, pausing every few seconds so the men could give a half-hearted war cry. Vive l'Empereur! The rifles were biting at the column's front rank that had advanced so far up the road that the Voltigeurs were now running to join its ranks rather than fight the British skirmishers. Call the light company in! Sharp told his bugler. D'Alembourg, grinning because he knew his men had won the fight of skirmishers against Voltigeurs, came to stand behind Sharp. Not a man touched, he said. Tell them they did well, Sharp said. Then send them back to Captain Smith. If the French dragoons rode ahead of the approaching garrison, then the riflemen could pick off the horsemen. But you stay here, Sharp added to D'Alembourg. I've got a job for you. The enemy column was getting close now, little more than a hundred paces away and Sharp could see the men were sweating despite the day's cold. They were weary, too, and whenever they looked up, they saw nothing except a group of officers waiting on the crest. The line of redcoats had pulled back out of sight of the enemy, and Sharp did not plan to bring them forward until the very last moment. "'Cutting it fine, sir,' Delambord observed. "'Give it a minute,' Sharp said. The drums were loud." rattling energetically, though whenever the drummers paused to let the men shout, Vive l'Empereur! The response was feeble. These men were winded, weary, and wary, and only fifty paces away. Tarion! Advance! The Prince of Wales' own volunteers marched forward, their muskets loaded, and Sharp stepped back through the ranks and tried not to feel sorry for the Frenchmen he was about to kill. They were fools, he thought. Fools come to the slaughter. Tarion! Sharp shouted, Present! The muskets came up into shoulders. The French front rank faltered at the sight, then was shoved on by the men behind. Fire! Sharp shouted, and his whole battalion fired in unison so that their bullets smacked home in one lethal blow. Platoon, fire! Sharp shouted before the echo of the volley had died away. From the center! Sharp could see nothing of the enemy now, for they were hidden behind the thick cloud of gray-white powder smoke. But he could imagine the horror... Probably the whole French front rank was dead or dying, and most of the second rank, too. And the men behind would be pushing, and the men in front would be stumbling on the dead and wounded. And then, just as they were recovering from the first volley, the rolling platoon fire began. Aim low! Sharp shouted. Aim low! A column was a battering ram, designed to let half-trained troops feel the confidence of being a part of a crowd. But the men in the center of the column could not use their muskets, for they would only hit their own comrades, while the men in the front ranks and outer files were exposed to the murderous musketry of the redcoat line. That line, only two ranks deep, far outflanked the column, and so the musket balls came from in front and from the sides, and the unrelenting fire, the product of endless training, flailed the enemy. The air filled with the rotten egg stench of powder smoke. The redcoats' faces were flecked with burning powder scraps, while the paper cartridge wadding spat out between each bullet started small flickering fires in the grass. On and on the volleys went as men fired blindly down into the smoke, pouring death into a small place. And still they loaded and rammed and fired, and Sharp did not see a single man in his own regiment fall. He did not even hear a French bullet. It was the old story. The French column was being pounded by a British line, and the British musketry was crushing the column's head and flanks and flecking its center with blood. They're running, sir! They're running! Sharp had posted Ensign Nichols wide of the line so that he could see past the smoke. Away and running, sir! Nichols shouted excitedly as though he had spotted a fox breaking from a covert. Running like hell! Cease fire! Sharp bellowed, Cease fire! And slowly the smoke cleared to show the horror on the winter grass. Blood and horror and broken men. A column had met a line. Sharp turned away. Mr. Dallenbord! Sir? Take a white flag and ride to the southern road. Find a garrison commander. Tell him we've broken a French brigade and that we'll break him in exactly the same damn manner if he doesn't surrender. Sir, please, sir. It was Ensign Nichols jumping up and down beside Dallenbord. Can I go with him, sir? Please, sir. I've never seen a frog. Not up close, sir. 
They've got tails and horns, Dallenbord said, and smiled when Nichols looked alarmed. If you can borrow a horse, Sharp told the ensign, you can go, but keep your mouth shut. Let Mr. Dallenbord do the talking. Yes, sir, Nichols said, and ran happily away while Sharp turned back to the north. The French had broken and run, and he doubted they would be back, but he was not willing to care for their wounded. He had neither the men nor the supplies to do that so someone would have to go down to the enemy under a flag of truce and offer them a chance to clear up their own bloody mess, just in time for Christmas. Colonel Caillou watched as Colonel Goudin walked towards the two red-coated horsemen and felt an immense rage surge inside him. The British were holding a white flag, but only because they would offer Goudin terms, and Caillou knew that Goudin would surrender. He knew it. And when that happened, Caillou would lose his eagle that the emperor himself had presented to the 75th. The standard would be taken back to England and jeered through the streets. And Caillou was determined to prevent that. He drove back his spurs and in blind fury galloped after Goudin. Goudin heard him coming, turned and waved him back. But Caillou ignored him. Instead, he drew his pistol. Go back, he shouted in English to the two approaching British officers. Go back. You will leave me to deal with this, Goudin insisted. Dallembourg reined in his horse. You come out here, monsieur, he asked Caillou in French. Go back, Caillou shouted angrily, ignoring both Dallembourg and Goudin. We do not accept your flag, you hear me? We do not accept a truce. Go. He leveled his pistol at the younger officer who held the offending white flag that was nothing more than Dallembourg's handkerchief tied to the ramrod of a musket. Go back, Caillou shouted again then spurred his horse away from Goudin, who had tried to place himself between Caillou and the two British officers. Sir, Nichols looked nervously at Dallenbord. It's all right, Charlie, Dallenbord said. He won't shoot. It's a flag of truce. He looked back to Caillou. Monsieur, I must insist upon knowing if you command here. I command here, Goudin asserted with a glare at Caillou. Then, Monsieur... Dallenbord said, removing his hat and bowing in the saddle towards the disheveled Goudin. I must tell you that we have already... He does not command here, Caillou shouted, and he pressed a knee against his horse, and the animal obediently stepped sideways, knocking Goudin away. By the assault of the emperor, I am taking command. He turned in the saddle and gestured toward the Voltigeurs of his regiment, who were two hundred yards away. Advance, he shouted. You do not command here, Goudin snapped. He was suddenly as angry as Caillou, and he drew his own pistol, and Dallembourg watched, astonished, as the two Frenchmen threatened to shoot each other. And just then, as their fingers tightened on the triggers, Ensign Nichols' borrowed horse twitched, and the ensign instinctively reacted by tugging the reins, and the horse tossed its head. Colonel Caillou, seeing the motion at the edge of his vision, must have thought the younger British officer was attacking him, or at least trying to disarm him, and still enraged, he swung the pistol round and pulled the trigger. The pistol's flame was very bright in the dusk. The sound of the shot echoed from the hills, then faded. The voltigeurs, obedient to their colonel, were hurrying past the watching dragoons, but then their officer held up his white hand, because a second shot had sounded. The shot sounded as Ensign Nichols was falling from his saddle. Caillou's bullet had torn through one of the gold laces his mother had sewn into his red jacket, and then it had pierced his young heart. He was hurled back in the saddle, and the makeshift white flag toppled. He made a choking noise, and threw a last fading glance at Dallenbord, and then collapsed sideways to thump onto the stony road. Caillou was suddenly aghast, as if he had only just realized the enormity of his crime. He opened his mouth to speak, but no words came, for Colonel Godin had fired, and that second pistol ball took Caillou beneath the jaw, ripped up through his soft palate, and so into his brain, and Caillou, without a sound, slumped dead onto his pommel. Colonel Godin put his pistol back into its holster. I command here, he told Dallenbord in English, to my shame, sir, I command here. Dallembourg, his face hard as stone, delivered Sharp's message. One brigade of Frenchmen had already been defeated, and the British force at the top of the pass was now ready to give the same treatment to Goudin's men. Dallembourg carefully did not say what forces the British possessed, for if the Frenchmen had known it was only a single battalion, 
than he might have chosen to fight. We are waiting for you with riflemen and redcoats, he said instead, implying that there might be at least two battalions at Arati. You may fire, sir, or you can spare your men's lives. Gudan had heard the terrible musketry and knew what kind of horror his men must endure if they tried to force the pass, but he was not inclined to yield too easily. I respect your flag of truce, he told Delambord, glancing at the red-stained handkerchief that showed beside Nichols' corpse. And I agree to talk with your commanding officer. Delambord hesitated. If he agreed with Gudan's proposal, then the Frenchmen would discover just how weak the British were. But on the other hand, he would also meet Major Sharp, and no one had ever thought him weak. So, Delambord nodded. You will order your soldiers to stay where they are, he insisted, and you may come to the village to discuss terms. Gudan nodded, and the battle, at least for the moment, was over. Sharp heard of Nichols' death while he was still watching the French take their dead from the northern slope. He swore when he heard the news, but he dared not leave the pass, not until he was sure the French brigade was gone. But he sent two more companies back to the village to keep their eyes on the enemy, who were waiting a mile southwards. Then, when night fell, and he was satisfied that the northern brigade had withdrawn to the deeper valley and offered no threat, he stalked back to Arati with pure bloody murder in his heart. He saw the horses tethered outside the Casa Alta, and he kicked open the tavern door in a rage. What bastard bloody Frenchman dared kill my officer? He shouted, storming into the room with one hand on the hilt of his heavy cavalry sword. A tall, gray-haired French officer stood to face him. The man who murdered your officer is dead, monsieur, the Frenchman said in good English. I shot him. Sharp stopped and stared. His hand fell from the sword hilt and his mouth dropped open. For a second he seemed unable to speak, but then he found his voice. Colonel Goudin, he asked in amazement. Goudin smiled. Oui, Caporal Sharp. Mon colonel, Sharp said, and he stepped forward with his hand outstretched. But Goudin ignored the hand and instead clasped Sharp in both arms and kissed him on both cheeks. Denham Ward, watching, smiled. I knew it was you, Goudin said, his hand still on Sharp's shoulder. I'm proud of you, Sharp, so very proud. There were tears in the colonel's eyes. And for your officer who died, I am sorry. There was nothing I could do. The door from the kitchens opened, and Daniel Hagman poked his head through. Need more towels, Captain, he said to Denham Ward. Then noticed Sharp. Hello, Major. Didn't know you were here. Well, I am bloody here, Sharp said. And what do you want towels for? Aren't you supposed to be on piquette duty? Not having a bloody bath. I'm delivering a baby, sir, Hagman said, as if that was the most natural thing in the world for a rifleman to be doing on Christmas Eve. Isn't the first baby I've done, sir? The frog doctor was going to slice her open, and that would have killed her, but I'll see her right. It's no different from slipping a lamb into the world, except the hooves aren't as sharp. Thank you, sir. He took the proffered rags from Dallambord and ducked back into the candlelit kitchen. Sharp sat. Dallambord began to explain that he had permitted the pregnant woman to come to the village, but Sharp waved the explanation away. He did not care. He saw that Dallambord and Goudin had started on the wine, so he poured himself a mug and took a long drink. What am I going to do with you? he asked his old colonel. Goudin spread his hands. On a decrees that I should fight you, Sharp. What the hell are you doing here? Sharp demanded truculently. You approach me with the flag of truce. I am using that truce to discover what choices I have. You've got two choices, Colonel, Sharp said in a harsh tone. You can fight me or you can surrender. Either way, I don't care. I like a fight. Goodhand smiled. You haven't changed, have you? Your men are down the road. Sharp went on as though Goudin had not spoken. And there's damn all they can do tonight, but you can lead them up here in the dawn. The pass narrows, Colonel, you've seen that, and I'll fillet you. I'll give you a Christmas present of dead men. And don't think your Voltagaz can take my flanks. I'll have riflemen up on the hills, and they like killing Voltagaz. And when they've done for them, they'll shoot your officers, then your sergeants, and when your men are a leaderless rabble, I'll bring in the bayonets. I've already done it to those buggers over there. He pointed north. And you know how many men I lost? He paused, but Gudan offered no guess. None, Sharp said. Not one. And tomorrow I'll do it again. 
it was all bluff. If Goudin decided to fight, and if Picard renewed his attack in the morning, then Sharp would be scrambling for his life across the high ground. But when a man held a weak hand, it sometimes helped to bid high. Your choice, Colonel. You haven't changed at all, Goudin said. How many men do you have? Enough? Goudin looked at down board. He took me prisoner in India, Captain, and he was only a corporal then. I'm not a corporal now, Sharp said dangerously. Goudin smiled sadly. He could see red uniforms and green uniforms inside the tavern, and he assumed there were at least two battalions in Arati, and he knew his tired troops could not beat them, and he feared that the partisans might come from his rear in the morning, and so he tugged his sword out of its scabbard and laid it on the table with its hilt towards Sharp. I fear I am your prisoner again, Caparel, he said sadly. You and all of your men? Sharp asked. Of course. Sharp hid his relief. He had bluffed and won. So now he pushed the sword back towards the Frenchman. It's good to see you, Colonel, he said, suddenly friendly again. It truly is. He poured more wine and pushed the wineskin towards the Colonel. And how have you been, sir? Not well, Sharp, not well, Goudin confessed. You see that I am still a Colonel, just as I was in saint It seemed that after that I could do nothing right. I'm sure that's not true, sir. You were the best officer I ever had. Goodhand smiled at the compliment. But I have had no luck, Sharp, no luck at all. So tell me about it, sir. It's the night before Christmas. Good night for a story. So tell me. So Goodhand did. General Maximilien Picard sulked. He sat by a miserable fire in the deep cold valley and he listened to the moans of his wounded, and he knew he had been well beaten. He had scented defeat from the moment he had seen the demonstration volley that the British had flaunted from their high ridge. But Picard had always thought he was a lucky man, and he had hoped that his good luck would serve to drive his column up the hill and through the thin British line. But the column had been shattered, and his conscripts, instead of tasting victory, were now more fearful than ever. He drank from a brandy flask. It was three o'clock on Christmas morning but he could not sleep. The skies had cleared so that the Christmas stars were bright, but General Picard felt nothing but gloom. Coudin's doomed, he said to his chief of staff, Major Santon. If we couldn't break those bastards, what hope does he have? None, sir, Santon said. I don't mind losing Coudin, Picard growled, but why must we lose Caillou? Now there's a soldier for you, and if we use Caillou, Santon, you know what else we lose. The eagle, Picard said, and flinched. We will have lost one of the emperor's eagles. He said the dread words slowly, and his eyes filled with tears. I do not mind defeat, Santon, he said untruthfully. But I cannot bear the loss of an eagle, an eagle of France, gone to captivity. Santon said nothing, for there was nothing to say. To a soldier of France, there was no shame like losing an eagle. And in the dark hills above them, an eagle was in desperate danger. I can bear anything, Picard said, except that. Then, from above them, all hell broke loose. To the defeated French brigade in the deep valley, it sounded like a battle to end the world. True, there was no artillery firing, but the experienced soldiers claimed that they had never heard musketry like it. The volleys were unending, and the crash of those musket blasts was magnified and multiplied by the valley's echoing walls. They could hear faint screams and shouts, and sometimes a hill bugle call, but above it all, and never ending, the hammer sound of muskets. There was volley after volley, so many that after a while the sound became continuous, a deep, grinding sound, like the creak of a hinge on the gates of hell. We should go up and help. The car said, rising to his feet. We can't, sir, Santon insisted, and he pointed to the crest where a line of British officers still stood guard. The moon was unsheathed from the clouds, and any Frenchman trying to climb the slope would be a sitting target for those riflemen. Goudin must fight on his own, Santon said. And Goudin must have been fighting, for the musketry, instead of fading, grew in intensity. Picard reckoned it must be Caillou who fought. 
for surely poor old Gaudin could never fight a battle like this. Every now and then, a brief glow showed in the sky, betraying where a group of muskets flamed together, and soon the heavy, foul-smelling smoke spilled over the pass's lip to drift down the moonlit slope, and still the splintering volleys ground on. Up in the pass, Sharp loaded his rifle. He did it quickly, trained to the intricate motions by a lifetime of soldiering. And when the gun was loaded, he raised it to his shoulder, held the muzzle high into the sky, and pulled its trigger. Faster! he shouted. Faster! And all around him, redcoats peppered the sky. They fired volley after volley at the stars. And in between the volleys, they whooped and screamed like demons. You pity any poor angel up there tonight, sir. Sergeant Patrick Harper said to Captain Dallenbord, He'll lose a few wing feathers, so he will. And then Harper fired his volley gun at the moon, and down in the valley the deafened French gasped, thinking that at last the artillery was joining the fight. Faster, Sharp shouted. Vite, vite! A group of French soldiers pulled their triggers, scattering a volley towards the snow on the highest peaks. Daniel Hagman walked calmly through the chaos and noise. It's a girl, sir! he shouted at Colonel Goudin. A girl? Goudin said. I thought on Christmas Day it might be a boy. It's a pretty little girl, sir, and she's just fine. It's always her mother. The women are looking after her, and she'll be ready to move in a while, just a little while. Sharp had overheard the news and grinned at Goudin. Cold night to be born, Colonel. But she lives sharp. They both live. That's what matters. Sharp fired his rifle at the stars. I was thinking of the baby Jesus, Colonel. His birth must have been cold as hell. Goudin smiled. I think Palestine is a warm country sharp. Like India, I doubt the first Christmas was cold. I think our Lord was born on a warm night. Well, at least he never joined the army, sir. He had more sense. Sharp rammed another bullet in his rifle, then walked down the boisterous line of soldiers. Redcoats and Frenchmen from Goudin's garrison were mixed together, all of them firing like maniacs into the star-bright sky. Faster! Sharp shouted. Come on now, faster! You're celebrating Christ's birth! Make some bloody effort! Beat! Beat! It took a half hour before Maria and her newborn child could be laid in the wagon, where they were cushioned with blankets and swathed in sheepskins. The new baby had gifts, a rifleman's silver button, a broken ivory boot hook that a red coat had lifted from the battlefield of Victoria, and a golden guinea that was a present from Peter Dallenbord. When the mother and child were comfortable, the wagon driver whipped his horses northwards, and all the Spanish women and children whom Goudin had tried so hard to save fell in behind the lumbering vehicle. They climbed the gentle pass, and the French troops who had been shooting at the stars fell in around them as the wagon passed. A hundred Frenchmen joined the women, all of them from Goudin's garrison, and their colonel was the very last man to join the procession. Yes, sir, Sharp said, and he stepped forward and offered Colonel Goudin the eagle. Goudin stared in disbelief at the trophy. You are giving it to me? Sharp grinned. I've already captured one, sir. I don't need another. Besides, I took the flag off the staff just as a keepsake. Goudin took the eagle on its bare staff, then hugged Sharp and kissed him farewell. After the war, Sharp, he said huskily, I shall see you after the war. I hope so, sir, I do hope so. There was one last charade to mount. The riflemen guarding the frontier ridge, those who were in sight of the enemy far below, fired their weapons, then ran in pretended panic as Goudin's small procession approached. And from the valley below, General Picard watched in amazement as a small group of Frenchmen appeared at the ridge's crest. There were only a few men, a mere handful, less than a tenth of those he had expected. But they had fought their way through. They had even brought a wagon through. And then Picard saw a golden glint shine above the dark shapes who fired back at the ridge behind them. And he raised his telescope and stared intently, trying to track down the elusive gleam. And suddenly, it was there. It was the eagle. He could see its spread wings. Say, brought the eagle, Picard shouted. They're saved, the eagle. And his defeated men began to cheer. The firing in the high pass died slowly to leave a nil of powder smoke sifting down the slope. 
The riflemen and redcoats grinned. They had enjoyed the nonsense. None had wanted to spend Christmas in this high country that was so far from their beef and plum pudding. But the expedition had turned into a game. It was a pity about Ensign Nichols, of course. But what had he expected? Everyone knew that Mr. Sharp was fatal for Ensign's, but at least Mr. Nichols was to be buried in France. Sharp had insisted on that. The boy had come to fight the French, and for all eternity he would hold a tiny scrap of captured French soil. But no one else had died. No one else had even taken a wound, and the regiment had turned back a whole French brigade, while in the village, under the guard of the Grenadier Company, 900 French prisoners waited to be marched back into Spain in captivity. But 100 Frenchmen went free. 100 Frenchmen, their women, their children, their colonel, and an eagle. They went free because Sharp, to help an old friend, had given that friend a victory. And Sharp now watched Goudin's men go down the slope, and he saw the men of the defeated brigade run to greet them. He heard the cheers, and in the silver moonlight, framed in the lens of his telescope, he saw the brigade officers cluster around Colonel Goudin. Unlucky Goudin, who on a Christmas morning had saved an eagle and fought his way to freedom. Colonel Jean Goudin, a hero at last. Do you ever think they'll find out that it was all faked? Harper asked Sharp. Who'd ever believe it? If, if you heard the tale, would you believe it? I'd think the man telling it was drunk, Harper said. And then, after a pause, a happy Christmas to you, sir. And to you, Patrick. I suppose it'll be mutton for dinner. I suppose it will. We'll buy a few sheep and you can kill them. Mm, not me, sir. You, sir. Sharp laughed, then turned south towards the village. It was Christmas morning, a crisp, clean, new Christmas morning, and his men were alive, and an old friend was a hero, and there would be mutton for dinner. It was Sharp's Christmas. Christmas.